Well, hello, and thank you for joining us on The Village Online. I'm really glad that you've shown up, and I hope and pray that today's going to be a good day for you. I love that we can meet this way. I love that if I hit on something that's helpful, you'll let me know. And uh, I appreciate it. I've always felt like I was a pastor to people who didn't have a pastor. Maybe you're somewhere around the country, and we maybe haven't even met. But I appreciate you letting me be your pastor and speaking to you just a little bit. You ever experienced trauma? I want to talk today about a traumatic experience that I went through, and and I hope it's going to be something that will be helpful to you. Jesus begins the story of the Good Samaritan, one of his most famous of his parables, like this in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Now, we use this story to teach the importance of being a good neighbor. Uh, You remember that two religious people passed by and they left the poor man just still bloodied on the side of the road. But finally, a Samaritan came by, and uh, that was a hated ethnic group. The Jews did not like Samaritans. But in the story, it was the Samaritan that helped the man. But you know what's interesting? I never really considered the man, the man who was robbed and who was beaten. What did it feel like to be him? Had it ever happened to him before? Just I know it's a story Jesus tells, but that character that Jesus is talking about, had it ever happened to him before? Were the robbers cool and calculating in their efforts, or were they vicious? Was the robbery just about money, or were the robbers hate-filled towards this victim? How did the man process emotionally what had happened to him? Have you ever been robbed? I, uh, first moved to Texas, when I first moved to Texas in 1980, and uh, then took a church as a pastor in 1981. But before I took the church, I was a cashier at Safeway, and uh, I experienced a robbery. I was at Safeway, and a man came running through the store and pulled himself up into the manager's office, and he had a gun, and we just all were kind of frozen at our registers, and he got the money out of the manager's office, which was kind of an elevated thing that sat in the middle of the store, close to where the cash registers were. And he jumped out and he left. And so we didn't have time to think about it, but it's like, oh my gosh, I think we just got robbed. And then, and this is, I find this funny, but way back in 1981, August the 22nd, 1981, I became the pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Rosenberg, Texas. And uh, they had interviewed me over several weeks, and I had preached every sermon that I knew. And then they finally decided, yes, we'd like you to be the pastor. So I became the pastor. But then I had to figure out, what am I going to preach about? Because I was a young guy, and I didn't have a lot of sermons. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll start a series on the Ten Commandments. I know. I wasn't the brightest guy, but that's what I decided to do, preach the Ten Commandments. And uh, I started doing the Ten Commandments. Well, October the 11th was the date that I was ordained officially that Sunday night. Our whole little church went to the First Baptist Church of Houston where the pastor laid his hands on me and all the men came around and they prayed for me and it was my official ordination. But I've been preaching through the Ten Commandments and that Sunday morning at my little church, Second Baptist Church of Rosenberg, I had preached the eighth week of the uh, series. That evening, my mom and dad and my sister, everybody came into town. My whole church went to the ordination at First Baptist Church. When I returned to my apartment after the ordination, a window had been busted out in my apartment and everything that I had of value was stolen. The night that I was ordained, everything I had that was of value was stolen, including my cassette recorder that I carried with me everywhere I went because it was the thing that I recorded my sermons with so I could listen and see how I was doing, if I needed to work on some things. And it still had the Sunday morning sermon in it. And you know what the Sunday morning sermon was? My hand raised to heaven. The Sunday morning sermon was, Thou shalt not steal. And the robbers, the burglars, took my cassette player with that sermon in it. I've often wondered, I wonder if they listened to it. I wonder if they said, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this. A few years ago, Something happened that was much more traumatic than either one of those circumstances, and uh, I wanted to share it as kind of a launching off 
place. Um, my wife and I had been out of town. We came back into town. We had loaned somebody the truck. We were trying to find the person who had the truck, and they were having phone difficulties. And so I had left my house in the evening to drive to the person's house to find out if he still had the truck. He did. I said, hey, we're going to need it. Why don't you drive it back over to the house, and then I will be waiting for you. When you drive it to the house, I'll take you back to your house. He said that would be fine. And so I drove back to my house, expecting he would be behind me in the next 10 minutes. And I was sitting on the curb at my house about 10 o'clock at night in my car when all of a sudden I heard a tap on my window and I turned and I looked into the barrel of a gun and I rolled the window down and the person said, get out of the car, give me your wallet, give me your phone. And the person, mask, gun, got in this SUV and took off. And it happened so fast. And I went to the front door of my house and I knocked on the door because I didn't have a key. And Jane came to the front door and I said, I just was robbed. And she said, what? I said, I just was robbed. And police came and they took a report and some neighbors had video cameras. And uh, from the video cameras, we could tell what had happened as I was sitting in front of my house, I think I was probably scrolling Facebook, and a car had come down a side road, and when they saw my car idling on the curb, they turned their lights off. It was an SUV. They turned their lights off, and then they turned onto my road and pulled up right beside me. And again, I'm scrolling Facebook, not the smartest thing in the world to be doing. I'm scrolling Facebook, and the person got out of the car. I didn't hear them. And then I heard the tap on the window and I turned and looked into the barrel of a gun. Crazy, crazy thing. And uh, I was, of course, uh, very adrenal. The adrenaline was just flowing. And so that night it was kind of hard to go to bed. But I did finally go to bed about 2.30 in the morning. And I, I tried to process when I woke up the next day, I tried to process what had happened. And of course, I've thought about it a lot since then. This was a few years ago. And uh, from time to time, someone will come to talk to me about some trauma that they have experienced, and it makes me go back and think about this. And so I thought it would be helpful to talk to you about some of the things that I had thought about as it relates to the trauma that I experienced, and maybe, just maybe, this could be helpful to you, or if not you, then maybe someone you know as it relates to trauma. What were the thoughts that I had in the aftermath of having a gun put in my face and being robbed. And my greatest hope is that something I say could be helpful. I don't know what trauma you maybe are dealing with or what a friend of yours may be dealing with. I know there's all kinds of traumas, abuse, broken hearts, abandonment, um, people who've been in war zones and experienced things that I can't even imagine, uh, the death of uh, family members or friends or being told that you're not loved. That's trauma, being rejected by your church because you are different than maybe what they think you should be, uh, maybe failing publicly in a way that has been embarrassing to you or being humiliated in front of people. You know, there's all kinds of ways that uh, people have trauma. And so I hope that this talk will be helpful, um, and I hope it'll serve you today. Let, let me share with you some of the things that came to my mind that I've thought about a lot since then. Uh, the first thing is just one word, and it's proportionality. Proportionality. As it related to my situation, I had to think about kind of what I had experienced. And one of the things that dawned on me is people have handled far, 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 far more than what I had to handle that night. Now, I'm not minimizing stuff that you've gone through. I'm just saying proportionality helps me understand that people have handled a lot more. We have a friend named Amy Copeland, and I don't even remember how many years ago Amy came to our church, and she's been to our church a couple of times. She's kind of really famous in Georgia. Um, she was a bright, young uh, college student, I think working on her master's, and she was zip lining in a lake or a river, and she got a flesh-eating bacteria, and it actually um, began to spread, and she ended up losing her hands 
and her feet, uh, part of her legs. And uh, it, it was all over the news. I remember when the story was on the news. Um, and then when I had a chance to finally get to meet her, she's become a therapist and she's just this most amazing human being that you'll ever meet, ever. And had her tell me and then tell our church her story. It was one of the most amazing things. She said this, and, and this is more where I'm going with this. When she was at the Shepherd's Hospital in Atlanta, and she had lost her hands and her feet, she said she was so touched by looking around and seeing people who had lost more, people who were quadriplegic and were in the hospital. And she said it just let her know that people had experienced worse. Didn't minimize that what she was experiencing was horrible. People had experienced worse, and it just gave her a sense of proportionality. Back in 1997, my wife received a phone call that her only brother, who was a wonderful human being, and her only nephew, his son, a wonderful human being, had killed each other in a domestic dispute. They had never had one second of violence. It happened to be a just a something that happened, and there were guns there, and it just was a horrible thing. And I remember Jane telling me the story, because I didn't know her back then, and me thinking, oh my gosh, that is the most traumatic thing. I can't even imagine that. But my wife, we dated for a few months before she even told me that, and I, I think about it all the time. How did she get through that? Again, proportionality, my trauma wasn't that. My trauma was way different. My situation was bad. I'm not minimizing it. It was trauma-inducing, but I wanted to remind myself that others had gone through far worse situations than this. I found myself saying this was bad, but it could have been far worse. I believe we often focus on the bad without considering the good we experience and the devastation that others have endured. So over the next days, as I was thinking about it, people would try to uh, offer me words of encouragement and try to be helpful. And uh, they would say things sometimes I didn't understand where they were coming from. Don't you wish you'd had a gun and you could have blown their brains out? Or It's like, that. no, that never crossed my mind. Some of that stuff was frightening that they said, but I kept coming back to proportionality. This, was, this, was, this wasn't insurmountable for me. This, this wasn't the end of the world for me. Quick word to you, your trauma might have been one million times what mine was, probably was a million times worse. But you know what? You're still living. You still have a life. You still can create something with your time left here on the earth. They hurt you. I get it. They hurt you. Maybe they hurt you really, really, really bad. But they can't keep you down. And out of the grave you will come. Resurrection is possible for you even when you don't think it could be true. You can move beyond this trauma, and that's something that was helpful to me. Here's a second thing that I thought about then, and I've thought about it often since then. I determined, as much as it was possible, I was not going to let fear control me. And I'm sure you know the saying, you have to get back on the horse that threw you. Um, I haven't always gotten back on the horse. Uh, When I lived in South Africa in 1973, I was 11 years old. And we went horseback. We went to a school to learn how to ride horses. And I remember it was an English saddle, and we had had several uh, practices. And on this particular practice, I had a horse that was just in a wild mood, and it began to rear up on its back legs and began to kick. And And after a while, it threw me, and uh, it, it honestly scared me. And I didn't get back up on the horse. I didn't ride a horse again for about... 50 years, Jane and I went and rode a horse last year, and I don't even know if you'd say rode. The The horses we got on were so old, they barely could walk. I mean, there was no chance they were going to throw us. They might have died under us, but they weren't going to throw us. But uh, I didn't get back up on the horse, and I, I hate that when I was an 11-year-old because I should have. I should not have let fear have such a grip on me. One of the adages that I've taught my sons when they were growing up is, do the thing you fear the most. And the death of fear is certain. Do the thing you fear the most, and the death of fear is certain. The night that I was robbed, I was laying in the bed, and I couldn't sleep. So about, I guess, 3 in the morning, I got up, and I thought, I'm going to reclaim my space. 
And I went outside and I walked up and down in front of my house where the sidewalk is. And I thought, this is my yard. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm reclaiming this space. And I remember right in the middle of all of that, a car turned down our street and the lights came down. I saw the lights and I went running back up to the house and I said, this is enough for today. I will do this again on another day, but I have done it today. I'm not doing it anymore. Here's something that I, uh, I really believe. And I think I said this, what fear do you need to face today? The key to life is learning how to stand up to your fear. It's not easy, but it's necessary if you want your interior life to be healthy and strong. And I'm just saying that to you now, trying to encourage you. There's some things you need to stand up to. There's some fears that you need to overcome. And maybe today will be the beginnings of that for you. So many people wrote me and said, I know you'll be getting a gun now. Well, they don't know me. I have no interest in ever having a gun. I'm trying since that day to keep my eyes open better, to not scroll when I'm outside in the vehicle late at night, but to be vigilant, keep my eyes open, but I don't want to live in fear. Here's another thing that has been helpful to me. It was helpful to me that night as I was processing it, the next day as I was processing it, and even to this day, it's maybe the most important thing I could say. Be grateful for your life. It can all end in a blink of an eye. Be grateful for your life. I was overwhelmed with gratitude that night when I realized that I was still living, that it hadn't turned out as bad as it could have turned out. When I went to bed and could feel my wife laying next to me, I thought, God, I'm so grateful. I know it didn't have to turn out like this. It could have been far worse. When I went to church the following Sunday and I was able to hug our village family, I remember thinking, could have turned out far worse. I am so grateful that I have people who love me, people that I love, people that are going through this life together as, as friends, part of a chosen family together. I've got a wife that I adore, and I am just going to be grateful, grateful, grateful. I want to every day be grateful. So that morning that I woke up after being robbed, I called my, my parents. I called my sons. I told them it was going to be on the news, so I told them uh, so they didn't hear it that way. But uh, more than anything, I just wanted to know how grateful I was that they were in my life. When I'm at my healthiest, I start the day with being grateful. And if I'm being honest, the list of things to be grateful for is endless. So many things. And I have felt a passion since that night. I have felt a passion for gratitude, maybe more than any other time in my life. And so if you've gone through trauma Maybe trying to get on the other side and find something to be grateful for, maybe that would be healthy. Here's another thing that that preacher Ray Waters said, pretty good. Go against the current and be the person who lives with unabashed gratitude for every little thing. That change in your attitude will change your life, and it will open your eyes to a world bigger and more wonderful than you ever imagined. And that is true. Rumi, the 13th century Persian poet, jurist, Islamic scholar, theologian, and Sufi mystic said it well, gratitude is the wine of the soul. Go on, get drunk. And I like that. Go on, get drunk. Gratitude, the wine of the soul. Here's another thing that helped me with trauma. I needed to forgive quickly. I needed to forgive quickly. Life is too short for me to hold bitterness in my heart. Now, I, I've heard people say that you know, the forgiving quickly and that, that could be something that's not good for the, for the victim of trauma. And so you have to process this the way you can process this. I know my trauma wasn't as bad as so many people's trauma. I just needed to forgive quickly. That has resonated with me, and I hope it'll resonate with you. I remember when I was 24, 25, I had some bitterness towards a person in my life, and that bitterness was eating away at me. And I remember being in a conference when I finally released the bitterness towards the person that I was angry at, and it was one of the greatest things I have ever done in my life. And I felt for the first time in a long time that I was free. I was free. And so since then, I have just not allowed uh, that lack of forgiveness to build up in me because it is not healthy for me. 
it hurts me. Being bitter at the robbers was not going to help me, so I needed to forgive them quickly. I have said from that day until this one that I hope the young men who did it, I hope that they could be brought to justice. But when I say that, I don't mean maybe what you think. I, I want them to be brought to a justice that would help them, not punish them. There are two types of justice. Retributive justice is the justice that we know about in America. We all know about retributive justice. That's the system of criminal justice based on the punishment of offenders. We've got to punish these people. It has nothing to do with rehabilitation. Retributive justice is based on three principles. Someone who does something wrong, especially when it's a crime, they deserve to suffer a proportionate punishment. Second thing, it is morally good to punish people with the punishment they deserve. And the third thing, it is not morally good to punish an innocent person or to punish someone disproportionately. That's kind of the three big thoughts around um, this kind of retributive justice. This is our system. Other than taking a person off the street for a while, nothing else good happens, by the way, with this system. And the system that we have is fraught with enormous unfairness. We are seeing that it's not really justice at all when people of color are more than five times likely to end up in prison than white people when they commit the same crimes. We see that in our justice system. You know that that's true. Totally different topic. Don't even know why I said that. Totally different topic. But those of us who come from a little more progressive point of view are beginning to understand the shortcomings of retributive justice, and we are being drawn to an idea called restorative justice. I heard, first heard about this as it related to apartheid finally being eliminated in South Africa. You know that apartheid began in 1948 in South Africa, and in April of 1994, finally, with blacks making up 75% of the population, the country had been controlled by whites for its entire time from 48 to 94. But finally, they had democratic elections. Nelson Mandela was uh, voted in as president. Desmond Tutu was kind of the religious leader that was so prominent back then. And they began something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which said, if you have done things that were heinous to mainly the white South Africans, if you've done heinous things, you will be forgiven if you'll just be honest. If you'll just be honest about it. And they had these truth and reconciliation commissions, and some of those stories are unbelievable about how people would be honest about some of the things they had done to um, blacks during their time in South Africa and how they were forgiven and how important that was. I have a friend. He has preached at the village. He is a dear, dear soul. Uh, he was a pastor at St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Atlanta. His name is Josh Noblet. I remember interviewing Josh Noblet on a podcast years ago and Josh talking about he and a friend of his enjoying a picnic at Piedmont Park when they were accosted by a group of, of young people who began to beat them up because they were gay. And so this group, um, rowdy people just thought that it would be fun to beat up on these two gay men, were beating them up and a gun was pulled and it was a horrific thing and traumatic if, as you can imagine, traumatic. And the police were able to arrest all of the people that were involved. But Josh, who is such a brilliant, compassionate servant of Christ, he wanted to, as best he could, ensure that restorative justice was what these boys experienced, not retributive justice. And his heart was not for vengeance or punishment. His heart was the heart of Jesus. Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. He wasn't willing to let the justice system just do its thing. He actually pushed and, and did everything he could to, to try to be a part of the process of being able to help them find a better way. He wasn't content to just let the boys be punished. He was driven to help them. He described doggedly engaging the criminal justice system until he was able to speak to the boys in court. And then he began to exchange letters with the boys. And forgiveness isn't given for the sake of the person who hurt us. It is part of our healing process, but it also can help the person who has perpetrated the crime. And I felt the same way about the, 
the, the one man who came up to my door, there were others who were in the SUV. I didn't see them, but I, there was obviously a driver and there were some other people that were in the vehicle. I didn't want anything horrible to happen to them. I wanted them to to learn that life could be better. They didn't. I wanted to help them. I, if I could have found out who it was, I wanted to help them find a better way. And uh, that's restorative justice. You know the quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's often attributed to Dr. King. But did you know Dr. King was paraphrasing Theodore Parker, who was a Unitarian minister who wrote this in 1853? Look at the facts of the world. You see a continual and progressive triumph of the right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divide it by conscience, but from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. And I would say I believe it bends towards restorative justice, helping people who've committed a wrong find a better way, help them figure out a better way to live. Josh Noblet experienced healing as he insisted that the perpetrators be exposed to his humanity because he knew retributive justice wasn't effective. He understood the principles of restorative justice. Restorative justice, if I just need to define it a little bit better, it's the theory of justice that emphasizes repairing the harm caused by criminal behavior, and it's best accomplished through cooperative processes that allow all willing stakeholders to meet and to be able to discuss and talk, and it really lets the victim be able to talk to the person who's perpetrated the crime and them to be able to understand each other, and it's a good thing. It's an alternative approach to wrongdoing that recognizes that people who commit crimes aren't simply criminals. They're people who are struggling and have never fully been loved into a better way of being. Here's the three big ideas of restorative justice. Repair. Crime causes harm and justice, so it requires repairing the harm that you've done. It includes encounter. The best way to determine how to do that is to have the parties decide together what is most important. And third, it includes transformation. This can cause fundamental changes in people, relationships and communities, transformation. And that's what I wanted to happen. I believe God's justice is restorative. There are ample examples of how God's desire is that all of humanity be restored to its rightful, healthy place. God's justice is not punitive. God's justice restores. Finally, last thing, just processing and hoping that this is helpful to you. I wanted to find a way to always keep love in the center of the scenario. So even as I've thought about it since then, I thought, I want to make sure that every time I talk about it, love is in the center of the scenario. Because when love is in the center, there's, there's a chance it can affect people for the good. What about you? Have you been able to kind of try to find a way to put love in the center of whatever the trauma was you've experienced? People have responded with comments about the way that I'm trying to handle this as I was going through it. They said, Ray, we, we could have never handled it like that. I don't know that I did it so special. I just know that I didn't want to be angry at the boys that did it, and I wanted to keep love in the center of all that I did. And I think by doing that, I was able to process it, and I was able to move ahead. Again, I recognized what happened to me was quick. Nothing. I lost some money, lost my phone, not a big deal, but it was still traumatic, and I just was thinking maybe you're going through some trauma, and maybe this would be helpful to you. Thank you for listening to my story, and I hope it's helpful, and I'd love to pray with you. Would you bow your heads, please? Oh, God of peace, God of healing, God of grace, we recognize you in this moment as we think about trauma that we have experienced in this life. God, I know there are people who have experienced incredible trauma, and I pray for them. Help us understand the ideas that I've tried to explain today, proportionality, overcoming fear, forgiveness, gratitude, restorative justice. Help us believe that there is life on the other side of trauma. God, we love you. And we pray this in Christ's name.
There are three ways you can give to support the love-focused, culture-changing, ever-evolving, community-building, Jesus-inspired work of the Village Church. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979 and you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com or you can send a check to The Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Have a great week!